It's good for us to be together to reflect on how we might best relate to one another, particularly men as men, men with men, men with women, women with women, how we might be appropriate, healthy people. But in light of Saturday's tragedy at the Tree of Life Synagogue, I want to begin with a minute of silence, a minute that I invite you to think of those who love you and those whom you have loved and how this love might grow and increase so that the tree of life might flourish. One minute. So thank you, thank you to Eileen Flynn for arranging this evening's address, to John Bell for recommending our speaker, to coaches, to student affairs, all who have encouraged your attendance, and most of all, thank you, students, for being here. Tonight's speaker is an interesting guy, uh, Don McPherson. He quarterbacked the Syracuse University football team back in 87 when they went undefeated. He got drafted by the Eagles, uh, spent some time in the NFL and the Canadian Pro Football League until 1994, when he became the National Director of Athletes in Service, founded and directed Sports Leadership Institute at Adelphi University, and has become an active speaker and provider of educational seminars to address complex social issues. I think there are about 12 different institutions he's been speaking at since August. This has included MIT, Syracuse, UCLA, UCLA, to name just a few. There's one line, I don't know whether we'll have a chance to hear more about it, but he said at one time that his coach at Syracuse directed him to play within himself. I find that to be a very interesting challenge. Whether that works its way into tonight's lecture, I don't know, okay? but I am very excited and very interested in hearing what Don McPherson has to say. Don, please. How are you? How many of you are not student athletes? Raise them really high. Okay. I figured I'd go with how many of you are not. Is that better? Yes. Just so I have a sense of, thank you, um, a sense of, it doesn't matter if you're a student athlete or not, but you all know, um, I, I always say that, that nervousness is adrenaline sitting still, right? So if you're an athlete or if you're in theater or um, if you're an educator and, and you're nervous about your lecture and all of a sudden you get out there and you, and you get that, and I was a football player, so you get that first hit or that first swing or that first stroke in the pool, and all of a sudden it starts to go away, right? You start to loosen up a little bit. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Everybody? Okay. That's where I am right now. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, my nephew um, graduated from here many years ago, played lacrosse here. Um, so I'm excited to be here because I get to send him pictures of his campus. Um, I, as Brother Norman said, I've, I've been on about 12 campuses this year and it's been a kind of a grind. So if you hear me a little nasally, I'm a little tired. I've been struggling with a little bit of a cold coming off of planes and all that. Um, and I'm, I'm typically and normally a little pensive sometimes about these conversations, and, and I'm gonna get into this in a minute, about conversations that we've all been raised not to have, not to talk about, and the silence that, that allows problems to perpetuate and to continue in our culture. And so I'm a, I'm a big believer in having difficult, and co difficult conversations. And so I'm always a little 
especially with, with younger people, the desperate need we have for you to have conversations that my generation and previous generations did not have the courage to have. We're asking you now to deal with a whole host of issues that previous generations just either completely ignored or gained from the silence. And so now we're laying on you to have to talk about a myriad of things that people even my age, I'm 53 years old, don't even know how to talk about. So we put a lot on your shoulders to deal with a very rapidly changing society and world that, that, that you all are growing up in. And I feel very often as an adult, uh, I feel responsible for that, and, and I'm angered by that, but that's how I started doing this work, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I want to just, because I can't, um, and I don't know, to tell you the truth, I don't even know what, but I have to. Y'all know it's like that nervousness thing, you have to exercise things that are on your heart, and if you don't get rid of them, they just sit there and they fester, and I'm going to talk to y'all about having difficult conversations. I don't know where we are as a country. And, I, and, and I'm <laughs> when a bunch of elementary school kids are slaughtered in their school, we do nothing. A woman who survived the Holocaust is in her synagogue. Got killed for being a Jew. She survived the Holocaust. That was the longest minute of silence. I had to say something. I didn't know what. And I didn't know what I was going to say. But I need you to know that if you hear from me in my tone at times that sounds aggressive, that sounds harsh, that sounds direct, that's where it's coming from. We've got to figure out how to talk to each other. We've got to figure out how to love each other. We've got to figure out how to different, have a difference of opinion, have a difference of perspective. Otherwise, that's our norm. And I feel personally, that's what we've given you. We've given you that as a norm. We haven't given you, and pardon me, I know that, I, I, I know this is where I'm from New York, and, and I talk with my hands, and I tend to curse from time to time. Sometimes it feels like it's unnecessary. But that's fucking ridiculous that that's the norm. Where's the outrage? Where are we pissed off that this is our culture? And so that's the part that I had to get off my chest. And to your point about my old coach, and I don't know where you got that from, but that was um, my favorite thing that my old coach taught me. It's the, my, my, the thing I say to him all the time, play within yourself. And when he first said that to me, I had no clue what it meant. It took me a number of years for me to figure out, you know exactly what it meant? What I'm doing right now. What I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm freestyling. I don't, this is not part of what I normally do, but I have to do this because if I don't do this, I'm not being authentic. I'm not being real to me. I would be up here bullshitting y'all and I don't want to do that. I'm telling you how I feel on the real and, and I got to do that before I can move on. And so let me just ask y'all to do something for me because I need y'all to do this for, everybody just do this for a second. Just take a deep breath. Does that feel a little better? Was I getting y'all a little tense? <laughs> You feel it? You're like, yo, this dude's a little angry. <laughs> he's, he's, a little, he's a little intense. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, but I had to play within myself. So um, I know some of y'all think that this is a, um, some people said Title IX talk. I know that if you're a student athlete, you'll get your credit. Make sure you sign in so you get that credit. Um, but I really want, what, if, if, there's, if there's one takeaway <laughs> Um, I, I think you have is, is what I just said, is, is figuring out how we have 
a different conversation about how we love each other. And there's going to be a lot of talk about masculinity and what I refer to as the blind spot of masculinity, but this really is a talk about how do we have a more positive, more, and, and it might not always sound positive in the way I present it, but a more positive, more focused conversation about how we prevent, not just prevent sexual violence, but how we foster and promote healthy relationships. And relationships are one of those issues that we all don't really talk about very often. We just kind of go blindly in how we enter, enter in and out of relationships. And, um, and this is not even a, a conversation specifically about that as much as how we talk about all of it and to be comfortable talking about all of it. That's how I got involved in doing these kinds of programs. I was a student athlete at Syracuse many years ago and, and played football at Syracuse University back in the 80s. I was part of a program called Athletes Against Drunk Driving. I was going into high schools talking to students too young to drink and too young to drive about drunk driving. And I thought it was ridiculous because my only qualification to go talk to these young students about this really serious issue was that I was a football player. And I realized that adults were asking me to help them make good decisions around a difficult issue just because I played football. My, the only thing I knew about drunk driving at the time was how to do it. And I was being asked to go talk to, and I realized that I was a part of what I now refer to as prevention language and scare tactics. This is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Y'all remember that one? Yes, no? No, just say no to drugs. I was part of that just say, just say no to the prevention language. This is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. How about that mango car? How many of you had that mango wreck car get dumped in front of your school and say, if you drink and drive, these are the consequences, right? You're not thinking about that wreck car when you're going out with your friends. You got your, you got your going out music on, you're looking at yourself in the mirror, right? Am I the only one with going out music? <laughs> Y'all know you have it, right? When nobody's looking, checking out your jeans in the mirror, like, yeah, this is gonna work. <laughs> right, you know, think about that mango car, that prevention language, scare tactics, the scare tactics in the prevention language, just say no. I was part of that just say no generation of drugs. I was a quarterback, my best friend in high school was my wide receiver. We were together all the time, everyone thought we were brothers. We both had big, big afros. We were brothers, you know what I mean? We were Brothers, you just want siblings, brothers. My best friend, senior year in high school, started selling cocaine. How do you just say no? A whole group of friends didn't have a problem with what he was doing, because he had money, he was life of the party. It's not so easy to just say no, or just walk away, just wait, which one is just wait? Sex, Sex. thank you. It's like, you don't even want to say it out loud, thank you for saying it the way you said it. Right? Think about prevention language and scare tactics. Like around sex, we tell you sex is dirty, it's immoral, it's going to cause unwanted pregnancies, STIs, all these horrible things. But then we say, but save it for the one you love. <laughs> it's all these horrible things, we do all these bad things, but save it for that one special person. <laughs> right? Talk about, and every time I, I, when I talk about we have to have a more honest conversation, if we're going to deal with these, these different issues, and <clears throat> Here's, I'm gonna tell y'all a secret that adults don't want you to know about sex. This is it. Sex is amazing. It is wonderful. On a scale of one to 10, it's a 50. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. If it's done without respect, without love, without care, without, without accountability, without communication, it's a 50 bad. It's a 50 bad. And it's a bad that will, can ruin lives. It's a bad that will ruin your perspective on yourself, on your partner. Here's the problem that we have now as a culture. We are afraid to have that conversation. We want to talk to you about sexual violence. The whole Title IX piece is all about, about campus, sexual, campus sexual assault. We want to talk about sexual violence, but we, want, we don't want to talk about sex. And I'm not even talking about, we don't want to talk about bad sex. We don't want to talk about the fact that it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. It's arguably the, the greatest thing. I would like to believe that people in this room, the greatest thing that people do, two people do, is to be physically intimate with one another. And we're afraid to talk about it. And here's the problem with that. 
The people, and, and it's, you know, again, I go generationally that we're afraid to talk about because now you all expose so much more sexual behavior and sexual innuendo and sexual conversations than ever before. But here's who's hurt by the silence. You. You're hurt by the silence. Because we don't talk to you about how to do it properly. We don't talk to you about what it looks like in a healthy way. We don't have conversations about how we, as I always say, that, that, that we as adults, that's why I say that these are issues that we've all been raised not to talk about. You don't talk about the domestic violence in your family, the sexual violence in your family. You don't talk about the, drug, the, the alcoholism in your family, the drug use in your family. You know what that silence does? It allows those problems to continue to happen. You go to my hometown, you go to the barbershop, where I get my hair cut on Long Island. Anybody here from Long Island, New York? Hey, what town? Riverhead. Riverhead. He's out there. <laughs> I live in Huntington. All right. He's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you go to my hometown, you see the barbershop where I get my hair cut, my brothers get my hair cut. You hear people talk about my family. Say, first in family. Oh, that's a cool family. My oldest brother played for the San Diego Chargers, now runs a mega church in San Diego. My second brother was when I was in college at Syracuse. He was, um, and my other brother was with the San Diego Chargers. My other third brother was ranked second in the world as a middleweight, middleweight fighter. My mother was a school nurse in the middle school. Everybody knew my mother. Everybody knew my grandmother's dog because you had to go past our house to get to, to the high school, in the back way, the back way to cut to the high school. So remember my grandmother had a big German shepherd. Everybody knew my family. My two sisters, really popular in town growing up. My father was a police officer. Everybody knew my family. Oh, the McPherson family, that's a cool family. They didn't deal with all those problems, like the drugs that came through the problem and, all, and came through our neighborhood at one time, like I mentioned a minute ago. And that's a lie. I had a grandfather I never knew. My grandmother I just told you about. My grandfather I never knew. He died when I was three. I was told my whole life he died in a car accident. No, he died drunk in a car by himself. He was an alcoholic. But we didn't want to talk about that as a family. I have an uncle. You know, your really cool uncle. Really funny one that cuts up on your dad. Right? He's the one that gets away. He, he's one that, bless you. He's the one that always got, did this trick with the nose, with the thumb. Right? Which I don't know how to do, so I end up flipping all y'all off when I do it. So. <laughs> my cool uncle and cool aunt stopped coming to holidays together. We never talked about why. Because I got divorced. We didn't talk about the divorce. We definitely didn't talk about why. My cool uncle, alcoholic. You know what happens when you don't talk about your grandfather, you don't talk about your uncle? My brother I mentioned a moment ago, a boxer. Alcoholic. Functional, doing well. But it was our silence as a family that allowed this problem to continue and go generation to generation. And the times that we saw something, we saw signs, we saw behavior that was problematic, we didn't say anything, we kept silent. It was that silence that allows that problem to get passed on generation to generation. And so here we are in this moment that I refer to as the billion dollar problem. In this moment where now because of the silence of men primarily around the issue of men's violence against women has led us to this, what I refer to as this billion dollar problem. Billion dollar problem. But before I tell you about the billion dollar problem, I want to tell you how I got involved in doing this kind of work specifically around the issue of men's violence against women and sexual violence. And the perspective that, when you hear me talk about masculinity, the perspective that I'm going to bring tonight, and it's about breaking that silence. It's about men, men being part of the solution with our voices, by having those conversations, as I said, that we've all been raised not to talk about, and part of being, uh, part of, uh, of being able to not talk about something is part of our privilege as men. We don't have to deal with it. I think it's amazing that we're talking about it now with you all. And, and, but when I, when, when I was coming up when I was in school, we didn't even talk about this problem. And so when I retired from football in 1994, I went to Northeastern University, the place called the Center for the Study of Sport and Society. And I went there because I was doing this work about having an honest conversation with young people, helping young people make good decisions with good information, not using prevention language and scare tactics, but really truly helping them make good decisions with good information, right? And so, and which meant having honest and difficult conversations. So I went to Northeastern University partially because when I retired, uh, I met this guy named Richard Lapchick, who was a white man doing work around racism in sports. And I wanted to work with this guy because that was my issue. I wasn't a quarterback, I was a black quarterback. And so I went to, to Northeastern University to work with Richard Lapchick, and Richard Lapchick was um, the son of a guy named Joe Lapchick, who in 1950 signed the first black player in the NBA, a guy named Nat Clifton. And Richard Lapchick, who was just a boy, saw his dad get death threats and bomb threats at the Garden in New York because he had signed a black player. So I wanted to go work with Richard Lapchick, this white man who was doing work around racism in sports, because to me that was so inspiring. When I got there, I met this guy named Jackson Katz, who was doing this program called Mentors in Violence Prevention. 
And he was talking about something I never heard anybody talk about, much less a man. He was talking about all the different categories of men's violence against women, sexual assault, sexual harassment, rape, date rape, teen dating violence, all those different categories of men's violence against women, all having two important things in common. First and foremost, all involving men committing acts of violence against women. That's why I call it men's violence against women and not just violence against women. And if you think about it, and I, and I, I can't even, this is, if we're truly gonna do violence prevention, preventing it from happening in the first place, we've got to talk to men and boys. And I, I use this, unfortunately, this example to say, imagine if you heard, but when you heard Saturday morning, what was going on? Did anyone in here possibly think that that shooter was a woman? Anybody? If you, if you found out it was a woman, what would our response be? What would our response be? Surprise. Surprise. By the way, I, I'm just going to say something I should have said at the very beginning. Um, I'm going to ask questions directly to the men at times, um, but I don't ask rhetorical questions. So if I ask a question, I, you shout it out, yell it out, whatever. Right, we'd be surprised, right? What else? What's that? You think he was lying, right? We, and we, and we, and, but then when we found, if we found out it was a woman, we'd want to know what happened to her life? What trauma did she experience? What drove her? When boys do it, it's school violence, youth violence, gang violence, teen violence. Then we have the, 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 we, then we have the unproductive debate about, about gun control and mental health. Women have mental health problems and women have access to guns. Why don't women do it? But we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to examine it from that perspective. We're going to say, oh, we just don't know. We, couldn't, we don't know why this happens. We have to. If we're going to prevent violence from happening, if we have an honest conversation about it, we have to have the honest conversation about what's going on with men. So when I first heard Jackson Katz talking about the issue of men's violence against women, I, had never, I was 29 years old. I never heard anyone talk about the issue of, of sexual violence. So the second thing that all those different categories of, of, of men's violence against women have in common is that historically they, we've called them women's issues. So here's a question directly to the men. If we call them women's issues, what does that allow us as men to do? Say it. Ignore it. It's not my issue. It's not my problem. I'll have to deal with it. I was, I was going to... I was going to, um, I won't give it to you in graphic detail because uh, there's just too much of it in the room right now, but for me. Um, but I was, before I started doing this work, I was playing football in Canada. And I was living in a community where um, the worst, the worst case of violence against women, men's violence against women, horrific sexual violence and murder in Canadian history was happening in the community where I was living when I was playing in the Canadian Football League. And it was before I started doing this work, before I knew anything about this issue or anything about any of this. And I remember being in a restaurant where I used to hang out right on the water in Lake Ontario, beautiful sun, sunny, uh, su sunny day, and a car that fit the description of this guy was in the parking lot. And I remember the women in the restaurant, because they were all my friends, because it was a kind of a cool place to hang out. Most of the women that worked in the restaurant were young, college age, or just out of college, as was I. Sorry? Oh. And I remember the day that this car that fit the description was in the parking lot. And the, these women who I knew otherwise as cheery, friendly, energetic people, bless you, were freaked out. And I remember this because I, re, you know, sometimes in life you do things and you remember your shame. I remember my shame in saying to them, you're cool, it's okay, he's not in here. That's male privilege. And I might use that word and men might get a little pushback on, on the word privilege. That's privilege. There was a murderous rapist in my neighborhood and I didn't give a shit. I didn't care about how much I drank. I didn't care if I walked home alone. I didn't care if I locked my doors. I didn't care if I had a weapon on me. I didn't care if I knew self-defense because I knew inherently he wasn't looking for me. So here we have this problem, this billion dollar problem of sexual violence. As men, we can just say, it's not my issue, it's not my problem. I don't have to address it. That, I'm gonna come back to later, is the blind spot of masculinity, is that we don't address it. But here's the nature of the problem, 
is why I call it the billion dollar problem. Because right now we're doing the activism. Right? And men are saying, I don't know what to say, and women are coming out, and now women are accusing this, and accusing that. And the activism is serving its purpose. Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, and, and even a Supreme Court justice, if you don't think this, this issue matters, and what you do now today matters, imagine 30 years from now, because we had a Supreme Court justice who was arguing about what he did 30 years ago. That was before cell phones, and before text messaging, and before the, your, your carbon footprint that tells you all your behaviors that will follow you from now. So if you don't think this conversation matters, it matters. But here's this problem that is huge. And when I say a billion dollar problem, this is why I say it's a billion dollar problem. And, and the billion dollar problem comes from the silence of men around issues of sexual behavior. Predatory sexual behavior, excuse me. Predatory sexual behavior. If you take and Penn State, Michigan State, Baylor, and now you throw USC in the mix, that's more than a billion dollars that those schools are paying out because of the silence of men that allowed other men, to, this wasn't a single incident at any one of these institutions, it was the silence of men that let other men be sexual predators over the course of time. And now we have what I refer to as the billion dollar problem. Y'all know what a, how much a billion dollars is? Anybody know, anybody know the difference between a million and a billion? This is just that little, this is gonna be a little tidbit you can bring back with you for the holidays and, and, and press your family. Anybody, the difference between a million and a billion? 1,000, that doesn't mean anything, I don't do numbers, that, that don't make sense to me. That's what I'm saying, the way that I can understand it, because I don't know no numbers. Here's how I learned it. Just so when I say a billion dollar problem, I'm trying to impress upon you how big this is. A, a million seconds, I heard somebody say this at a conference, and it's been verified. A million seconds is 12 days. It's 11 and a half days. I'm rounding up to 12. So let's just say a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. A million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. Think about a 12 day old baby, still sitting there peeing on himself, and a 32 year old person. They're not even close. If I gave you a million dollars, you might quit school. Check out. A billion. And here's, here's why it's so big. Because we have remained silent about it. Because we have not had a productive conversation about it. We have not engaged men in a positive way. We haven't had a positive conversation around, around um, around sexual behavior. And here's the other part that, that where I feel like what frustrates me now that we're at is that we're telling you what not to do. We're not telling you how to do things right. And part of the solution to how do we deal with those complex issues, issues that we're afraid to talk about, issues that we don't know how to talk about, how, what's the solution? The solution is what you all do every single day. You prepare yourselves to make good decisions around difficult issues. No matter what sport it is, no matter what you do academically, you prepare for that exam. You prepare in theater, you prepare, and what do you do? You prepare over and over and over. You prepare over and over and over so you get it right in the heat of the moment. How many times does something happen, whether it's a fight or a misunderstanding or an argument, something, something bad happens, and you have to go explain it to your parents or your coach or somebody, and, 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 the, and the explanation begins with, you know, everything was cool, and all of a sudden, we were just chilling, and then out of nowhere, is that how it starts? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah, right? You know why? Because you weren't prepared for it. You didn't see it coming. Because we are silent about the problems, we're silent about the issues. And we're asking you to make good decisions around difficult issues with no information. And we're asking you to do that in the heat of the moment. That oh shit moment, that moment that you weren't prepared for, that moment that you were thinking about, you weren't sure if it was gonna happen or how it was gonna go down. And all of a sudden you react in the heat of the moment. I used to love the heat of the moment as a player, as an athlete, because that was that moment when I can like ignore my coaches as a quarterback, call my own plays and do my own thing and just ignore it. And I, used to, and I loved it now watching as a player, as, excuse me, as a fan. And I was watching a game a couple years ago with Syracuse playing against Northwestern, and Syracuse has been really bad for a number of years. And I'm watching this game, uh, I was on the sideline for the game, and it was, we had a brand new head coach, a guy who's actually now the head coach of Jacksonville Jaguars, a guy named Doug Marone, who, who I was a teammate of mine in Syracuse. So he was back in his alma mater. The quarterback was a guy named Greg Pauls, who'd been playing basketball at Duke for four years. 
But we needed a quarterback at Syracuse, and, and he had a year of eligibility to play football, and so he came back to be the quarterback. So there was all this excitement about Greg Paulus and Doug Marone, and Pat Fitzgerald was the head coach at Northwestern, and he and I just got inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame together earlier that year. So I was on the sideline, and they hit him jarring a little bit. There was 40,000 people in the Carrier Dome. It was the biggest crowd these guys had ever seen. There was a lot of stuff going on. It was a great game going back and forth. I'm not really a homer. I like to watch young people compete. I like to just watch athletes compete. So it was a good game going back and forth. The quarterback from Northwestern was lighting Syracuse up. And I was on the side like, man, this guy's going to be hard to beat. He made one mistake the whole game. They were, up by, they were up by three, up by two, excuse me, and he was driving out of his own end zone. And he threw an interception on the Syracuse side of the 50 with about a minute left in the game. And I was standing on the side like, have you ever seen Finding Nemo? <laughs> Y'all know, who, right? You know Finding Nemo, right? Remember, remember Squirt, Little Turtle? You remember when, when, when uh, you remember Squirt's dad, Crush? Y'all know Crush was mad high, right? <laughs> Crush, Crush was like, whoa, hey. <laughs> he had the droopy eyes and everything. He was like, oh, what's up, dude? What brings you to the EAC? <laughs> so you remember that scene when, remember Squirt? Remember Squirt, little turtle, he got shot out of, out of the current? And the fish, Marlon's gonna go get him, and, and, and his dad, Crush, was like, whoa, whoa, chill, chill, slow your motor. Let's see what little Squirt does. Y'all remember that? And Squirt made his way back into the current. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they got that interception, I was on the side, I'm like, I was like, all right, let's see what little Squirt does. <laughs> right, so they ran their offense on the field. There's Greg Paul, so hasn't played football in four years. There he goes, gets the first down, stops the clock, spikes the ball, they run the kicking team on the key. Kick kicks a 41-yard field goal, his time expires, and they won. And the place goes nuts. And I was on the sideline, like, that's what they should have done. You know why? They weren't surprised by that. They prepared for it. They knew bad things might happen. They knew they no one going to win every game. So they prepared for it. They had situation, they had language for it. Quick change, quick change. As soon as they, got the, as soon as they ran that, 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 that kicking team on and kicked off the Northwestern, they gathered the defense together and said, we're going to go after the ball. Get, try, to, try to strip the ball. Try to go after the interception. Make them make mistakes. We're going to blitz them. We're going to give them pressure. As soon as the defense ran on the field, they gathered the offense together and said, we're not going to have any, first, any, any timeouts left. We're going to burn our timeouts on defense. So get to the ball. Pace, pace, pace. Get out of bounds. Stop the clock. As soon as the offense ran on the field, they gathered the kicker. What do you need? 20, 25, middle of the field, left hash. They had language. They had prepared for it. They had talked about it over and over and over. And they prepared for it all through the week. And they took the heat out of the moment. We do that in athletics. We do that in the classroom. We do that in theater. We do that in any place that we want excellence. But when it comes to relationships and intimacy and sexual behavior, we use prevention language and scare tactics. And we also don't learn how to talk to each other and the impact that we have on each other. The impact that all of you have on each other. When I was in school, one of my teammates was charged with sexual assault. He was charged with rape. The story that we knew in 1984 when this happened was that uh, he and three teammates went out drinking and um, through the night he, excuse me, knew this girl he wanted to hook up with. They started drinking together. They went back to his, her dorm. Uh, these three guys and him drove her to her dorm. She signed him into the dorm. And, um, she, and then, then it becomes a he said, she said. And then it was she woke up and he was on top of her. That's the story that we knew in 1985. Here's what I know happened. I know that those guys were heavy drinkers. In fact, I was just texting them the other day because we were all watching the game, Syracuse play the other day, and we're all texting each other, we're all still friends to this day. And I know that those guys were like, man, I can't wait till we get to, I can't wait till we get to this weekend. Coach is on my ass. Can't wait to have a break. We were sophomores, so a lot of us weren't playing. Can't wait till we go out. Hey man, remember that girl you like? Yo, she hangs out at Maggie's. Yeah, cool, that's where we're going. Get to the, get to the weekend, man, I can't wait to get to this game. After the game's over, hey, where were we pre-gaming at? We didn't call it pre-gaming back then, but same thing. We were hanging, we were going to drink before we go drink. We get to the bar, yo, man, that's the girl. You're like, yo, buy her a beer. Yo, dude, she took the beer. You in, dog? <laughs> nah, man, we're going to just drive you, we're going to drop you off right here. Go handle your business. Go do your thing, man. Each one of those moments, 
was a moment for a teammate to help his teammate make the better decision. Nah, man, maybe the reason coaches don't ask is you drank too much last week. Why don't we dial it back a little bit? Nah, man, why do we have to drink before we go drink? Let's just go out. Yo, yeah, there's a girl, you're like, don't buy a beer, man, don't buy a drink. Nah, man, alcohol and consent, haven't we been hearing this since middle school? All right, so you bought her a beer. Y'all had a drink. That's it, get her number, talk to her tomorrow. Where's she going? We're in Latrobe. <laughs> not, like she, not like she rolled in here from Pittsburgh to come hang out. What's that place called? The, the, what's it? Falbos, yeah, not like she rolled in here to go to Falbos. Or Dino's. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it on the way in when I drove in. <laughs> nah, man, we're not letting you get out of this car. You're drinking, you're drunk, she's drunk, y'all been drinking. I'm not letting you get out of the car. I'm not talking about hating. I'm not talking about blocking. I'm not talking about whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about helping each other make good decisions. That's the stuff that we do every day. And that's the part of this, about this conversation that bothers me. That we are afraid to have those difficult conversations even with each other. and how we can help each other prepare to make good decisions, the things that you all do every single day. And so part of the, the, the work that I do is engaging men and getting men into this conversation. And as I said before, when I heard this from Jackson Cassidy, he was talking about all these different issues of men's violence against women, I started thinking about when did I learn what it meant to be a man? And when did I learn about sexual behavior? What informed the heat of the moment? What informs the heat of the moment? What, inf what are you thinking about in that moment when you're making those decisions? And that got me to a question that I, I have to ask, um, and this is, this is one of those questions that gets a little uncomfortable, but I, I have to ask this question because it's relevant to when I say what informs the heat of that moment, that moment when you're making that difficult decision. How many of you in here, from the people who raised you, taught you please and thank you, yes ma'am, no sir. How many of you from them Got a graphic, honest, and sustained conversation about sexual behavior, intimacy, sex, sex, and your bodies. Raise your hand. I see about five hands. So here's my question to the rest of you. If you didn't get it from them, where'd you get it? Your cousin? How much your cousin know? Huh? What you, said. You, you said your cousin? Yes. Your cousin know a lot about it? Yes, he was good, he was accurate. <laughs> what else did you learn about it? TV, TV. TV, movies, media? Yeah, what kind of media? What kind of TV or movies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Hang on. So if I said, and this is, this is, this is, this is a, 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 a generational experiment, in the context of what I'm asking right now, which y'all are thinking in the back of your brain, but no one wants to say out loud. Thank you. <laughs> does, does the term, the hub, mean anything? Does it? Adults in the room, do you know what I mean when I say the hub? I'm asking the adults. Any of them? Some. So sh Hang on. So I've been, I've, I've been asking that question, I've been asking that question for about 20 years. Is if you didn't get it from your parents, where'd you get it from? And when I first started asking that question, I knew the answer. I knew that it was media, right? And when I was a kid, media was a Playboy magazine. Or when I was 12 years old and my best friend was 14, told me I can go to, 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 to if we walk to a movie theater, we can get to see a movie called Manual in Bangkok. That was soft porn. And we walked. <laughs> 
It was the same movie theater where I saw Aristocats and, and Jaws with my family. So it wasn't some seedy back alley place, right? It was just a regular neighborhood movie theater. And, and Emmanuel in Bangkok wasn't that crazy. But I had to walk a mile and a half. And so the question is, if you didn't get it from the parents, who t- people who told you please and thank you, taught you how to, how to be polite and be nice and communicate with people, if you didn't get it from them, that place, Pornhub and porn on the internet, and now, and I can say this to you, think about, you might be able to say as adults, you might be able to laugh and say it's porn and laugh about it and laugh because you know what the hub, and adults don't know what the hub is, and you can rationalize porn, and anytime men especially try to rationalize porn to me, I say, okay, if you think it's benign and okay, put your mother in there. See, I didn't have to go there, right? Now you're mad at me. <laughs> but then if it's not, but here's the point, if, if it's cool and everybody's cool with it, then it should be cool. Can't have it both ways. So here's the thing, as if, if, if as older men and women we can say, hey, it's porn, it's just your flavor, all that kind of stuff. Think about this. Think about an eight-year-old boy. See, I've been, I've been talking about this issue for about 24 years, and I've always talked about pornography as in how it affects women. Because of the violent misogyny in pornography and how that affects women. But we haven't even started, we're not even courageous or the culture enough to start talking about how does it affect boys. I'm not talking about men, I'm talking about boys. And their psychosocial development of how to be intimate with someone. We're not even talking about that. This, once again, is the blind spot of masculinity. If we don't see violence against women as a men's issue, as our issue as men, then we don't pay attention to the destruction of that on boys. And I will tell you what Pornhub is. It's rape by category. Pick the way you want to see it. That's not caring, love, and intimacy. That's why you have trouble visioning your mom in there. And that's become normal. That's become the hub. That informs the heat of the moment. This is the problem I have with consent. And I'm not disparaging consent and any of the other things that we do to prevent men's violence against women and to, and to clarify the, the issue. But all consent does, consent does do two things. Number one, it puts the responsibility back on women to give permission. That's not what it's supposed to do, but that's what it ends up doing. So it puts responsibility on women. Did you give him position? Did you give him consent? The second thing, it doesn't get to the point that I just made a minute ago that we are not talking about. We are not talking about where do men fit into this healthy conversation about intimacy and sexual behavior. Consent is not getting to what needs to happen, and that's the conversation about men being a part of the conversation about healthy relationships and healthy sexual behavior. Consent should not just be a one-way thing, it should be a, it should be a, a, a mutual commitment to have a shared experience that is respectful, that is caring, that is communicative. We're not teaching that. And so this really horrible thing, I say horrible because it teaches, if that's your foundational understanding. And so when I heard Jackson Katz talking about the issue issue of men's violence against women, I was 29 years old. I never heard anybody talking about any of this. So I had to process, when did I learn what it meant to be a man? When did I see how I interacted with women? When did I understand what sexual behavior looked like? I was 29. That's why I say, at least fortunately, y'all having this conversation now, but you also have to go much further back. I had to go much further back. I'm gonna ask the men in the question, men in this room a question. When you were a little boy, go back as far in your memory as you, as you can go. When you were a little boy, what was the worst insult you could hear as a boy? What was the worst insult you could hear as a little boy? You're a sissy. You throw like a girl, you run like a girl, being compared to a girl. Men, anything worse when you're a little boy? Don't let me put words in your mouth. Y'all ever seen the movie The Sandlot? Y'all know that scene in The Sandlot? Did you know I was going there? <laughs> that scene in The Sandlot is one of my favorite movies like Nemo, because I like little innocent films. I don't like violence and scary movies and all that kind of stuff, right? So in, in The Sandlot, there's two groups of boys that they play baseball, they don't even have an opponent. They just play their game. They just love to play baseball, right? And there's one scene where these boys ride through The Sandlot from another part of town, it's clearly a confrontation. And they throw all kinds of insults back and forth. You a scrub, you an embarrassment to the game? 
that, who's that? I'm like, huh? I thought that was me for a second. We played on real field, all these different insults, and then finally the ultimate insult was levied. You play ball like a girl, and the music stops, and the kid he said to was like physically here, he was like, what'd you say? And the next line was, tomorrow I feel new. Those are fight words. Check this out, you can call a guy, that's my dog, he's a cool cat, he's like a truck, he's got pipes. You can refer to a guy as an inanimate object or an animal, and it's a compliment. But you compare us to our sisters, and it's the ultimate insult. That's the foundation of misogyny. That's the last thing you're gonna call me. That's the worst thing you're gonna call me. Two things happen when we hear that language as boys. The first thing is, we learn to man up at that moment. At least that's what the chat, that's a box. For those of you who can't see, I just drew a box on the board. First thing, we're we, we supposed to man up. What does it mean to be a man? What are we supposed to be? Shout it out, men. Brave, brave about what? Honorable. What does that mean, honorable? What's that? How have morals. Tough, strong, brave, honorable, anything else? I'm asking the men, but... Thank you. <laughs> Here's the thing. I, I've had, hang on. I've had, what was, was that? Emotionless. Are we supposed to, are we allowed to cry? Are we allowed to cry? The reason, the reason why I said I was asking, I was asking the men is just because um, we, I, want, I want us to own this. And this is kind of hard to see, so I'm just going to describe it because it's kind of fading me a little bit. But strong, tough, brave, honorable, emotionless. Anything else, men? Am I missing anything? I got one. Um, what's your name? Pope. Pope? P-O-P-E? Like the, the dude in, in yeah, okay. Uh, and what's your name? Tom. Callum? Tom. Tom. Sorry, Tom. Let's say Tom and Pope and I are hanging out, right? And it's summertime, and, we, and we're working out, and um, we're here for the summer, and working out, and we decide we're going to go, um, go get, a, get a burger somewhere, right? And we're, you know, one of those spots y'all mentioned earlier, right? And um, from across the room, Pope, I see, a, I see a, you know, a woman. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying anything, but he knows what I'm saying. I'm just going to do, raise my eyebrows, right? So, so I, say, um, I, say, I say, Tom, I'll be right back. I'm just going to go holler at her for a minute. So I go talk to her for a moment, for about 40, 45 minutes. I come back. Um, I, say, I say, Pope, I'll be right back, man. I'm just going to walk into her car. I walk into her car, and I don't come back inside. The next day when I see them, what are they going to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> He, could, he couldn't even get a word. I was like, ah. <laughs> what did I hear? Somebody said, somebody said, did you hear it? Did I, did I hear that? Yes? Okay. So, wow, this is like the incredible uh, erasing pen. <laughs> my, my edge. What did you give me? My box is, my box is gone. Okay. Great. So strong. Tough, brave, honorable, emotionless. Okay, hang on. So um, I just asked that question, right? And someone said, or well, at least somebody affirmed it. Did you hit it? Right? What else? How was it? How was it? So, okay, hang on a second. Let me, remember I said before, like, to have an honest conversation, we're really gonna deal with it. Is that language accurate? Does it get worse than that? What's that? It gets worse than that? Okay. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and, and let that get any worse. But I wanna make a point. Um, several, actually. Um, I created that scenario for three reasons. The first one is, the automatic assumption. I talked to her for 45 minutes. Remember I said before we actually make good decisions with good information? If we don't have a, this conversation, 45 minutes is enough time? And by the way, this is not just a, you know, men at uh, St. Vincent kind of, kind of response. This is men, and first time I ever asked that question, 
and it was in a mixed gender group, and it was, it was 20 years ago. And I asked that question, one of my buddies gonna ask me the next day, and it was a woman who said, did you hit that shit? <laughs> and here's the kind of crazy thing. She's the it that gets hit. This is, so the first, the first reason for, the, for, for that scenario, one is the automatic assumption. And I'm telling you this, not because I'm, a, I'm some sort of educator that does this work and stands up here in front of you. I went through this when I was in school. If I was just walking across campus with, with a woman and my teammates told me, yo, Mac, that's you? You hitting that? And you know what I would do sometimes back in the day? Because I was unaware and I was stupid and I was young. And I wanted them to think, you know me. <laughs> you know what I was doing by doing that? The first thing I was doing was protecting my narrow, insecure, immature masculinity. The second thing I was doing was I was putting her at risk. Because I, I, was, do, I was saying that she could get got in 45 minutes. So I created that scenario for, the first, for those two reasons. One was an automatic assumption. The second thing is the language. And, and here's... Here's the part of this, so, so the, here's, the, here's the part about the language. The, the, she becomes a piece, a sum, and it, you get that, you get a piece, you get some, that's a piece. I don't care what happens to that piece. I got another piece right here. I got more of it in my bag. The first message that we hear when we hear, if you feel like a girl to a boy, the first message we hear is to man up. The second message we hear implicit in that challenge or that statement or that insult you throw like a girl or don't be. is you're hearing that women and girls are less than. It would not have been an insult in the sandlot or a challenge in that otherwise innocent film with this really profound message of women and girls as less than. Kind of benign, don't even notice it. We hear it so often. If you believe that another group of people are less than, you're going to disregard them, disregard their feelings, disregard their rights. And I'm not even going to bring up the ideology of one group of people being less than another group and what that leads to. We teach that every single day with that kind of language. I always say we don't raise boys to be men, we raise boys not to be women or, or gay men. Because we always tell boys what not to be. Don't be a sissy, don't be a pussy, don't be a faggot. We're using that language to police and this narrowness of masculinity. And here's the part about this, the point that I want to make. It's just like I was saying before about pornography. That for so long we were looking at, at the violence and, and, and misogyny and por pornography that impacts women. But now looking at how it impacts men. And I've been saying this for many years and talking about that piece, right? That piece, that sum. But here's the other part that, and I'm, I'm being sort of uh, uh, I'm honest about where I've evolved in this conversation. Because in order for me as a man to see a woman that I supposedly care about and want to be with, I want to hit and hit and beat and, and, and smash and all that kind of stuff, I have to take my humanity out of it first. And we're not talking to men about what do we want in intimacy and in relationships. We're not having that conversation. And so that language She becomes the sum, the peace, and the it. And to me, the issue of men's violence against women boils down to some, in very, I don't want to say simplistic ways because it's not simple, but it boils down to that. And so part of how do we engage men in this conversation that looks at how we talk. And I go back to what I said before, the most beautiful, loving thing that we do as, as human beings is to be intimate with one another. Think about how we describe it. Smash, beat, hit. We don't talk about it in loving terms. We don't talk about it in positive ways. That's why I said to you at the very beginning, we are desperate, in desperate need of a loving conversation, of being able to love each other differently, being able to love each other, wanting more for each other wanting the best for each other, getting out of these narrow ways that we look. This is not, people will call it toxic, this is just narrowly defined. 
This doesn't make me a man. That's not what it means to be a man. Being a man is being loving and caring and sensitive, passive, submissive, and vulnerable. I'm not giving you my feminine side. I'm telling you my wholeness as a person. And we have to start finding a way. Because if a guy steps outside of this box, what kind of language does he get called? If a guy stops being these things, what kind of language does he get called? We'll see. What else? What else? Punk. What else? Ho. What's the purpose of the language on the outside of the box? What's the purpose of the language on the outside of the box? Say it loud. Put you back inside the box. This is the stuff that we do to each other. This is the stuff that we as men do to each other on a regular basis. We continue to perpetuate homophobia and sexism and misogyny, expecting that we police and govern this very narrow understanding of masculinity. And then we disengage you from the conversations that get us here. And here's what I refer to as the blind spot of masculinity and, and where we need to get to, because this is, this is the stuff that we do Remember I said before, how do you prepare for the heat of the moment? How do you help your, your teammates? How do you help the people around you prepare for the heat of the moment? This box of masculinity, as I have talked about and, and used this for many years in, in that whole paradigm about uh, women as less than. And I talk about this billion dollar problem and how we're still not talking. And how the consequences of our silence impact you. Because we don't teach you how to navigate life in a way in your wholeness. We don't encourage you to live in your wholeness. We don't allow each other to live in our wholeness, live outside of that. Or live more complete. And this is how I describe the box of masculinity, the ultimate, ultimate pain of the box of masculinity. There was a guy named Chris Gedney who played football at Syracuse. He was a senior in high school when I was a senior at Syracuse. Played catch with him, he was a tight end from Liverpool High School right outside of Syracuse. He was a high school American tight end, came to Syracuse, he was an all-American tight end in Syracuse, played in the NFL. Came back from, from, from the NFL after a, a great NFL career, came back to his hometown right, right there in Central New York, right there in Syracuse, became the Senior Associate Athletics Director for Major Gifts in Syracuse, doing fundraising. Can't tell you how many times I had a dinner with Chris Gedney and, and, and a dinner at a table of 10 at the biggest restaurant in New York City. And just living the dream, that was his big thing. Living the dream, how you doing Chris? Just living the dream, Don, you know. He had all his expressions. Are you running or are you really running? Did you make the team today? All the stuff that we've heard that always governed this. Married his college sweetheart, had four kids, living in his hometown, making money, good looking guy, 6'4", 6'5", good looking, good looking guy, cisgender, heterosexual white man, doing radio for football put a shotgun to his head and killed himself in March. When I got the news, it was from a guy who used to say to me, he's the next funeral you're gonna to go to. And I was at a football dinner in Atlantic City, I was about to go present an award to Baker Mayfield for the best college football player. Naturally, I didn't go. And I walked out to the boardwalk in Atlantic City and I called a guy who was his agent and I said, Chris just killed himself. And his buddy who knew him, lifelong friend, said, man, that divorce really hurt him. I said, Howie, that divorce was 10 years ago. So for 10 years, but nowhere along the line, and this is the blind spot of masculinity, right? Because he didn't have to. Chris never said, I need help. I can't do this. I am struggling. I'm not talking about in the, in the final days. Because I talked to him in, in, in a couple times in the final days. Chris, how you doing? Living the dream, Donnie. He wasn't living the dream. He was living a fucking nightmare. But he couldn't say it. Not in the final days when, when all hell was breaking loose and his life was falling apart. And he was thinking about taking a gun to his head. But when it first started getting bad, I need help. I can't do this. I'm struggling. Just like all of you are supposed to be self-confident, self-assured, self-aware. Because that's what being an athlete is, and that's what being a successful student is. He couldn't say, I need help. That's the first blind spot of masculinity. He's supposed to be a man. The second blind spot is everything I said to you. I use that word privilege again. He checked the box, every single one of them. 
So everybody around him said, what could possibly be wrong with Chris Gedney? Just like I'm sure many of you here from your friends at home or even on this campus, oh, you got it made, you're doing great. You're St. Vincent, man, that's great. You got family problems, you got academic problems, you got relationship problems, you got all host of personal problems. They're not all monumental, but if we don't talk about them, they become monumental. And in particular, as men, we're not supposed to talk about it because it makes you soft, makes you weak, makes you a punk. And so often, this conversation that's directed at the issue of men's violence against women is also a part of healthy masculinity. It's also understanding a more broad, more authentic sense of all who, of who you are. And so that's why the title about the blind spot of masculinity is if we're going to have a sustained conversation, if we're going to start having those difficult conversations, we need to learn to how to have them, and we need to hear them. And we need to start loving each other differently. I started this off by, I apologize, I, I know I probably went a little longer um, than it was probably hope. But I know no other way, and I know, I know no other thing. Prevention language and scare tactics ain't going to work. Slogans, campaigns, ain't going to work. We have to learn to communicate, to hear, and to love. That's all I got.